meeting, Lord, to help us do the things that are right for our people. We ask that you be with those who's, who are not here today, who are ill, have difficulties. Lord, we ask you to be with those folks who have <coughs> lost family members, who have illnesses to deal with, who have everyday problems, Lord. We just ask that you be with us and, and, and lay those healing hands upon them. We ask that you watch over those that are overseas, bring them home safely, give strength to their families as they await their return. And all of these things we ask in your heavenly name. Amen. 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 Roll call. Linda O'Leary. Present. Bill John Baker. Here. Bill Angle. Here. Jack Baker. Here. Arthur Connor. Uh huh. Bill Crittenden. Here. Meredith Frayden. Here. John Garvin. Here. Chuck Hoskin. Here. Bill Johnson. Here. Heather Keene. Johnny Keener. Here. Jack Bob Martin. Nevada Shotwell. Uh huh. David Thornton. Here. Here. Sam Rock. Uh huh. Here. 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 Second. Have a second. All those in favor, approve. Aye. 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 All those opposed. Motion carries. Uh, Bill John. Madam Chairman, at this time I'd like to put the reports at the end so that we can get through the, the meat of this. Why Todd is here, as he said, he has to leave at 4:30. Uh, and no business. Uh, under old business on the Cherokee uh, Nation benefit analysis, that's still under progress. So if we could. Table bash, or yeah, till next month, and uh, then uh, also we need to make a an item eight that uh, has mod six in it. 11. Mod eleven. Huh? Item eleven. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, back page. Uh, we need to have item eleven, which would be mod six, mm -hmm. and uh, put that in form of motion. Have a motion. Have a second. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, proceeding right along, we'll go down to law enforcement request. A community assistance request. I'm sorry. Doug? In addition to the items that were submitted in your package, um, I have I have four, four additional items. <coughs> Mr. Hoskin, Craig County Education Corporation, six hundred. Mr. O'Leary, eighteen hundred. Foreman Riding, Riding Club, <coughs> five hundred. Mr. Martin, Strawberry Festival Powwow Committee. Turkey County Elders, uh, Mr. Thornton, 500. Gail, was there another? Yeah, he was going 500 on the strawberry thing, too, Mr. Crittenden. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Mr. Crittenden, you're joining with Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin. You're not splitting 500, you're putting 500 each, correct? I believe that's what. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Any others? Phyllis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a change to my uh, to the one that I have requested for the March of Dimes and support I want to add five hundred for that, uh, making it a thousand. It's on. It's on the one that was requested that was in the packet, and I'm just asking to change that amount to one thousand. Increase to one thousand. To a total of one thousand. For a total. Okay. okay. Have a Bartlesville Indian Women's Club. Five hundred each. Five hundred each. That's already on there. No, no, putting it on now. Oh, was it already? It's on there, It's on there each. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Halfway through the. Uh, <laughs> 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 it is. There's, there should be a bill in the bill. It's on. It's like a six one or seven. Yeah. 
It showed up on the bill. Okay. Change it. Okay. Change it. Split that thousand. Okay. Is there any other community assistance, council, that we need to add? Uh, you have that one sheet that Andy under that's got turkey elders. You said the Indian. I said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 500. Yeah. That's in Marble City. Yeah, but it's got to go through the Church Turkey Church. County Elder Association to go to Marble City. Yeah. It's in Marble County, so I don't know the Church either. Yeah. 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 Okay, she can correct the title if it's not the correct organization. I have another uh, Call Court Senior Citizen Center 700. I'm married. Call Court Senior Citizen Center 700. Okay. Mr. Gardner. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair. Second. Move for approval. Have a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed, sign sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on down to law enforcement request. Okay. Um, Trying to go over these law enforcement requests and municipalities that are receiving assistance or just add to it from the report? Have to. Have to. Are there additions that we need to know about? There's, there's one, I have one here uh, $10,000, 5000 each from Ms. Fraley and Mr. Keener to Choteau Police Department for assistance with the um, vehicle. Oh, <laughs> there's none added. Can we have a motion? So moved. Second. Yes. Motion has a second. All those in favor? Aye. All those same sign. <coughs> motion carries. <laughs> Moving on to uh, new business. It's the Cherokee Nation General Corporation Act. <coughs> Crittenden and Thornton are the sponsors. And uh, who do you want to present that? Do you want to present it? Todd, <coughs> thank you. This is an act that would uh, amend the General Corporation Code, increasing your dividend from the current 35% and 30% and increase it to 35%, reserving that 5% to exclusively exclusively for contract health services for charity <laughs> uh, including but not limited to eyeglass adventures, prosthesis, and hearing aids. Okay. David, do you want to speak to that? And then Jackie Bob? Yeah. One thing I'd like to change here is, is ventures to do and uh, the main cause for that is we have a lot of, of our people that are coming and have to work and we might keep getting any cash. Uh, in my district right now, I've got a 13 year old boy that has four months from the look at his team, team. And at that time, he went in and the dentist told his mother that he waited too long to go out there with him. So they did a roof command, and now he's walking around with the roof command and then because they won't put a cap on it. So these type of things, we need to get covered. <coughs> Cover so, so our people out there <coughs> can get service. Before I second that, Two. can I say something? Before I second that, can I say something? Do you know, Mr. Okay. Uh, would, you, would you consider 
we do make one say actually saying caps, dentures and caps, because it say dental. We learned our lesson a long time ago that leaving it too broad doesn't do good. But I'll be well the second we do it. Okay. But anyway, I know that we made a covenant over here and we signed the blood that uh, you know, we, we won't take them down out of covenant. But what I want to know is. Uh, Doug? Doug? Yes. When this covenant that we made with the, with the bank, <clears throat> can that covenant not be changed? Yes. Can, uh, how much money has been borrowed on this government already? Do you have any idea? I have no idea if they've exercised any of that line of credit. Yeah. I wouldn't suspect they would because the last report I saw there was several cash. Ninety million. Yeah, ninety million dollars cash. So I wouldn't suspect they'd exercised any of the line, but what Sean says. Yes. Uh, to your point, Dave, we can certainly ask Bank of America for a waiver, and I, I think with the way our financial statements are, they would grant that. Uh, my suggestion would be to, to do that. Uh, the other thing I would like to point out, and uh, c and &E is uh, fully supportive of uh, supporting the people, and we understand that's what our mission is and what our funds are for. Uh, when we came to the council with a $50 million request for a, a line of credit, it was to fund the expansions that we already have planned and committed to, and I think everybody uh, agreed that we should go forward with. And as we uh, analyzed those projects and our cash flow coming in, uh, we cut back our request to $50 million, uh, knowing that... Uh, if the assumptions that we made held true, that that would carry us forward. Uh, as a part of that, we asked, uh, structured it where there were, I believe it was one, maybe two, additional $25 million uh, tranches out there we needed to tap into that to carry us through the uh, uh, construction period. Um, we looked at the 35% dividend uh, increase, and it would accelerate our borrowings on that credit line by two months and extended approximately three or four, which is not an issue. But what, what it would do is we would have to, it looks like, come back uh, unless economic conditions change uh, and ask for an additional uh, tap into that additional 25 uh, to take it up to 75 to carry the project through to completion for what we have committed. So. That was my point in, in uh, talking today. It's not yay or nay. It was just that when we, if we do this, this, according to the information we have now and the projections that we make, will necessitate that we do tap into that extra $25 uh, million dollar tranche if, if the way that we anticipate this construction going forward takes place. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. uh, with your permission, I'd like to go and pull the, the uh, Job Growth Act. Yes. Uh, it, it's my recollection that that act created three slices of a pie. One of them is the dividend slice of 30 percent. One of them is C and E slice of 40 percent. And the other one is C and B slice of 30 percent. And I think if we're going to increase from 30 to 35, obviously we have to identify which of the other two slices that 5 percent is going to come out of. So, with your permission, I'd like to go try to get that out. But anyway, uh, well, I, what I really brought this forward for is for our people. And I truly believe that we need to balance these scales with the nation's discretionary funding for our people. And I think they're sitting out there crying for it. And if if you haven't been out any of most your people, you should know that they are. And I think that's very little to ask for to help our people physically, and it will also help them mentally. Uh, you know, there's, there's different things that's happening out there. Not only does work come in, you know, 
we have people who have high level wood that had a broken arm that he couldn't even get in up here uh, to see a, a doctor because he had went to the emergency room and, and they put a splint on his arm. They said, well, that's all they could do up there at Hastings. But there, there's different things that's happening up there. And I've, I've got one guy that uh, was prescribed. He told that he had cancer. And that was <coughs> out of Hastings. Well, he's been sitting four months waiting for somebody to notify him where he can get some help uh, to try to get rid of this cold and cancer and stuff. And man, people out there, it's just ridiculous. But, but uh, if, if we can do this for our people, I think it's going to be a big help for them. And that's what I'm, why I brought this forward. I didn't, I didn't want to create you know, such a habit. That's the way I feel about it. Thank you. Well, we still got people on the water, too. Uh, yep. uh, Jack Brown. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> the best I remember, this item was uh, tabled from the last meeting, and I understood that uh, Mrs. Gower can come in and give a, uh, a report uh, on the on, <coughs> on the Indian Health Program. Uh, Jackie Bob, the Secretary's informed me it wasn't tabled. Okay, it was moved to this. Okay, okay, I'm sorry about that. It was moved to this meeting, but anyway, that she would have the information that we need pertaining to this. And uh, if you let me uh, continue, Tom, I don't see her here, but anyway, if you allow me to continue, uh, we asked Mr. Evans a while ago uh, about some. Uh, Plus, I guess you'd say in our general funds, general <coughs> funds, uh, uh, with that being available, uh, and I'm certainly sympathize with uh, Mr. Thornton. You know, there's always this need out there. You know, I mean, and need is in, in all the 14 county areas, and 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 I get probably I get more phone calls and visits <coughs> pertaining to health issues, uh, contract health issues, and uh, these type of things, and probably uh, we would probably never have enough money to meet all the needs, you know, that that is always a problem. Uh, but anyway, I would like to look at this and see if we couldn't get some figures, some kind of figures and dollar amount. And, uh, and and use the money from the gen fund and leave these other monies alone that we're uh, tapping into for the simple reason. I'll go back to the comments I made several months ago. I'd like to see C and E and C and B complete these uh, major projects that we have out there. And when these projects are completed, then you know, of course, a few years down the road, but then we can take a, a good hard look at how we need to spend those dollars. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Any <coughs> comments? Uh, <coughs> Madam Chair, yeah. uh, I signed on as a, as a co sponsor with David on this, and uh, most of the calls I get, uh, there's some situations like he, he talked about with the denture uh, or the uh, cap situation. But most of the calls I get are, are probably in the contract health area. You know, someone gets hurt, has an accident somewhere, and an ambulance picks them up. Well, they normally use Hastings or, or Mandela or whatever, and they wind up, the ambulance takes them to Salem Spring. And they wind up going through the emergency room and all this. And of course, contract health says they got to leave 72 hours to report. And then, well, they're hurt and traumatized and scared and everything else, and they don't take care of it for 72 hours. Well, when they get to where they can, they start going back to Hastings or wherever they, you know, been getting their health care from. Uh, but all of a sudden, here comes a bill for emergency room and uh, X-ray or this, that, or whatever. And these people, I mean, they can't, 
I mean, it, it impacts their life. They don't have the money to take care of that. So they try to go through the, the contract for them. And, of course, they get denied and so on and so on. And, and uh, that's an area there, that I think, that we kind of let them fall through the cracks from time to time. And that was another reason I thought this would be a good thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, John. Yeah, which, uh, what really disturbs me a lot, but I don't really condone it all right here, but it does say right here a, a primary issue discussed with so and so uh, for staffing fund for uh, FY 2007 and beyond, equipment funding as well as contract support costs. Uh, whenever, I mean, like I stated, not condoning new, new clinics and stuff, but uh, what, can you, what comes first, I've always asked, the chicken or the egg? Chicken or the egg, you know, to, to fund all this stuff here, you know, and uh, I just don't, of course, we create jobs, but no services. That's the way it appears to me. So I, I really just don't understand it all myself, of course. That's, that's me. The rest of you probably do, and good for you. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, Doug, uh, what's your mind? Yes, Madam no, Chair. Sure. I've got the Job Growth Act, and, and um, as it pertains to the, the, the debate related to this topic regarding the, uh, the increase in the dividend, this act states under jobs growth section 5A capital investments the CMB board of directors shall establish appropriate policies for capital maintenance and investments based upon individual subsidiary needs provided that Cherokee Nation enterprises shall retain a minimum capital for expansions from net income in the amounts equal to 40% of net income for physical years 06 through 08. Um, there's no mention in this act that CNB retains the remaining 30, but uh, by default, that's you know that's what that's the how, that's the size of the slice that's remaining after the dividend. So we go back to if you decide that that this body wants to increase the dividend, it by default if you don't refer back to this unless Mr. Hembry has some altering language that <coughs> that might uh, be appropriate. I, it looks to me like what you've done in the past would dictate that this slide would come out of the C and B portion, not C and E. And that C and E portion is where I believe uh, some of the discussion was centered around earlier. Thank you for clarification on that. Yes, Sean. I just want to point out one more thing from the from the business side. Doug, Doug's right. Uh, the, it's a 30-70 split. Mm -hmm. 70 is retained, 40 to CNE, 30 to CNB. When we did the projections and came to you on the uh, $50 million line versus uh, a higher one, it was uh, with the assumption, based on our discussion or somebody's discussion with the CNB board, that that 40% uh, or the 30% that goes to CNB would be reinvested back into CNE in these projects and that was what our cash flow projections were based on. So, uh, you know, all, my point is it, it's just going to extend the line of the payback period a, a little bit. But we will have to reach into that second tranche. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one can anticipate this $36 million in uh, carry over coming to the table. Uh, that would be a question from the treasurer. Uh, she hasn't issued the audit to, that I've seen as of as of now. Do you know when the, when the audit is going to be issued? Well, the big line is uh, end of May, and I think her intention was to meet it. So I think it's end of March. I'm sorry, end of May. So we're there, and I think her intention is to get it by close of business. Once that is issued... And once that audit has come over and has been issued with the uh, independent audit report, then that number, that $36 million unit, hasn't changed from the draft that I've seen. The only thing we would have to do at that point is determine how much of our carryover, unreserved uh, carryover, is already appropriated in our current year budget. 
the difference is what will be added to your available funds to appropriate. Thank Should be soon. Uh, what I was mainly trying to set up is that, that uh, the nation and, these, and the people of the nation will receive this on an annual basis and not have to wait on this. To, matter of fact, I think the audit is due to that. Yes. Uh, audit. And if you look in the Constitution, it should be here. Uh, I think it gives you, what, six months? I think it says 180 days. Um, Whatever it is, but <clears throat> by, that comes, by that audit not being here today, we're breaking the Constitution right here. So I thought you might not think about that. But what I was primarily trying to do is make sure that this would be revolving and come out of this funding and uh, it would be on an annual basis and we would never have to go with it. I might respond to that. This is another good reason why you know, we've talked about this in the past of taking the dividend and creating a separate funding source. And, and again, I think that we need to segregate this this business dividend in, as it's coming in here so we can understand where are these dividend funds being appropriated. Because right now, again, we have a barrel that at the top we've got six different funding sources coming in. At the bottom, all these tribal discretionary appropriations are going out and no one can say um, if you appropriate a million dollars for cancer, no one can say, well, did that come out of uh, dividend income or tobacco tax or, or lease income or any other type of a general tribal uh, source of funds? So um, we've talked about it with the treasurer, and I, and I would reiterate with, with administration to, to try to get that dividend separated so we Does can that understand. Does that look like that uh, legislation would maybe be appropriate along those lines then to spell that out? Well, I, I would Yes, you would need to uh, have that by like, specific legislative act to uh, uh, direct your gaming dividend to a specific uh, cost center. Let's take a look at that. Uh, oh, yes. I'm going to answer the question about the timing of the audit by the Constitution. It's required within six months following the end of the fiscal year, which would be tomorrow. Yeah, I put it in six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I got 180 days. Yeah. March 31st. You have a year though, isn't it? Two and a half I have I have sort of a maybe silly question, maybe not. If that is due tomorrow, then who's it presented to? It says presented to council by six months, which it will be in your hands by that deadline. Or over here. If you're not here to accept it, then. We'll be here. Uh, Saturday, right? So how does that work? How will it work? We will bring over copies before tomorrow. Uh, okay, you're saying that they'll be here today, mm -hmm. this evening. Yeah, that's not the tomorrow. It's close of business today. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I don't think there's been a uh, motion on this. Is that correct? Okay, I'm going to make a motion that we pass it and uh, that uh, in the middle of uh, line 18 uh, where it says uh, dentures, I'm going to add the word and ca uh, caps okay. between dentures and prostheses. And after hearing aids, I'm going to add uh, language, language that says uh, said 5% would be exclusive of funds. C and e, uh, that C and E be exonerated uh, under the Jobs Growth Act, uh, LA 3705. In other words, it will come out of C and B. Will not uh, be any of the money that we promised C and E. And I'm going to put that in the form of motion. Have a motion. Have a second. Yes. I believe it would be clearer if it said said 5% would be exclusive of funds CNE would be entitled to okay. under the Jobs Growth Act, which is Legislative Act 3705. That would be clearer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Yes. Do we have any idea? I know you don't have a crystal ball. 
have any idea what type of appropriations Cherokee Nation might be expecting in the next two or three years? Whenever we talk about taking the money from here and putting it there and paying away from C and B, and their objective is to create more business enterprises, etc. Do we have any idea of what we're dealing with there? We don't, except the general sense that it's not very positive, that at best we'll have flat budgets as we have when the war started. We've had flat budgets pretty much since then. So we try to hold the line on cuts, and those come along, we lobby against them and that sort of thing. And we have some cuts facing us that are being proposed that we lobby against, and sometimes they're restored. So at best we try to hold the line. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion on the floor. If there's no further discussion, we'll take a vote on that. It is an act, right? Yes. Bill Johnson? No. Heather King? Johnny Keener? Yes. Jacob R. Martin? No. Andrew O'Leary? Yes. Marilyn Shophouse? Yes. David Thornton? Yes. Kara Callum Marks? No. Bill Shorgi? Pass. Bill Ingram? No. Bill John Baker? Yes. Jack Baker? No. Audrey Conner? Yes. Joe Crittenden? Yes. Mary Frady? No. Don Garvin? No. Chuck Hoskin? Yes. Bill Shorgi? Eight yay, seven nay, one abstain. The act passes. Item number two, I believe that is Todd. Yes. Uh, as uh, I hopefully you all have received my uh, memorandum dated March 22, 2007, we have a disagreement as to the uh, constitutional powers of the chief. Uh, the chief contends that uh, he has a line item veto and, and, exercise, and exercise a line item veto, veto as to Legislative Act 1607, which was a comprehensive budget modification uh, that you passed last month. Um, my memorandum is uh, uh, self-explanatory. Uh, this is something, this is litigation that the ex administration expects, and I believe this is a question the court should answer. Bill Johnson. Madam Chairman, I move that uh, we uh, ask Todd to, in order to protect the, uh, the council and uh, its integrity, that, uh, that we uh, have, have Todd litigate this. And, uh, I mean, I think that the tribunal had spoken to this two or three times and I think uh, we would be remiss if we did not uh, ask uh, the Supreme Court to uh, to rule. Second. Have a motion, have a second. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I'm sure. <clears throat> what was the count on the vote on number one? Uh, eight, seven, one. Pardon? Eight, seven, one. Eight yeas, seven days, one abstain. What you got? Okay. Um, discussion of the Cherokee Nation landfill and the ICI contracts. <laughs> Madam Chair. Uh, you have requested uh, that the treasurer be here to address this item, and regretfully, she had already made plans before the meeting time had changed Friday, and so she was unable to change her plans. So uh, I think she communicated to you via email that uh, she wouldn't be able to attend to address this item. So I would suggest that you table it to move to the to next table. Meeting. So I have a motion to move the table. We'll have a second discussion. discussion. Yes. Uh, well. Unfortunately, she's not the one to put this on here. And, uh, point of order, Madam Chair. What's your point of order, sir? 
I have a motion to the table with no debate on that vote. Okay. Okay. So we're right on that? Yeah. Good. Motion to table, we'll vote on it. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. Aye. Same sign? Al Crittenden? No. Arthur Connor? Yes. Jack Baker? Yes. Bill John Baker? No. Your Anger? Yes. Billy Shargy? Yes. Kerry Cal Watts? Yes. David Thornton? Melvina Shop Pouch? Linda O'Leary? No. Jack Paul Martin? Yes. Johnny Keener? No. Taylor King? Bill Johnson? Yes. Chuck Hoskin? No. Don Garvin? Yes. Meredith Brady? Yes. Nine days. Five nights. <coughs> Motion of uh, this discussion is tabled until next month. Put it on next month's agenda, please. Okay. The next item is a discussion of Van versus Norton and related Friedman matters. Who's taking that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I believe I'd like to uh, start just by telling you what the activity is and the status of uh, now Van versus Kemphorn. That's the action pending in the District Court in the District of Columbia. Um, what has happened recently is an extension of time granted to plaintiffs to file their opposition to our motion to dismiss uh, for lack of personal jurisdiction or to transfer to the Eastern District of Oklahoma. Um, they've not responded to that yet. They asked the court for more time. The court gave them more time. Um, that's due May 4th. The government's response due the same day. Uh, our reply May 24th. And then, um, depending if the judge overrules our motion to dismiss, we have uh, 20 days after that to answer. Also pending in the Federal Circuit Court for the District of Columbia, is our notice of in intent to appeal on Judge Kennedy's initial opinion and order whereby um, he ruled that we were not entitled to sovereign immunity on this issue, that Congress had abrogated our sovereign immunity. Um, we talked about that. I think Mr. Miller talked about that in a phone conference with us. We filed a notice of intent to appeal. We've not yet filed our opening brief because no briefing <coughs> schedule has been set by the Federal Circuit. Um, those are the only of course, they're related. They stem from the same case. But those are the only c things pending in any court right now, to my knowledge, unless something's been filed in the last two hours that I haven't received notice of, which is certainly possible. Um, those are the only things pending. I wanted to update you. I can answer any questions about those for you. Um, I know that we have a guest here, and Mr. Hembree is going to introduce her. Madam Chairman, um, one of the uh, major reasons that this uh, matter is on the Executive Finance co uh, Committee agenda is uh, the question of federal funding, uh, the possibility of uh, it being frozen, gaining revenues if uh, the government-to-government -government relationship is uh, uh, disrupted. Uh, and throughout the, uh, the debate uh, or in the comments of this issue, uh, the matter of the uh, Seminole tribe had been brought up how we like the Seminole situation, how we differ from the situation. Uh, I was asked to uh, try to get someone on that uh, that was knowledgeable on that, and I believe I went to one of the uh, best sources available, which is the Attorney General for the Seminole Nation. She is here. Her name is Jennifer McBee. She is a Cherokee Nation tribal citizen, and I am honored to have her before this committee. Ms. McBee. Welcome, Ms. McBee. Thank, Thank you, you for much. coming. First of all, I'd like to say it's my privilege and my honor to be here to address my council today and I appreciate this opportunity. I do serve as the Attorney General for the Seminole Nation. I have served in that regard since 2003. Um, we have faced many issues with the Seminole and will uh, continue to hopefully resolve those. Um, my understanding from Mr. Hembury is that there were questions from this council regarding the similarities and the dissimilarities of the litigation and some of the issues stemming from elections and freedmen disputes. Um, as a way of self-introduction, just so you might know who I might be, I'm from Salisaw, 
um, Sequoia County. My maiden name is Henshaw. Both of my parents are enrolled Cherokees. Um, I want you to know that I want what is best for the Cherokee Nation. I am not here to sway you politically one way or another. I cannot tell you what is best. I can give you uh, my legal opinion regarding the Seminole Nation. I can give you a rendition of the facts concerning the Seminole Nation. Um, beyond that scope, um, with regard to the Cherokee Nation's position, that is primarily not why my understanding that I am to address. Yes. Hi. And, just, and just by way of information, uh, we did want the council to be made aware that Ms. McBee's firm does represent the United Kiptua Band as uh, uh, in certain litigation, and we, we wanted to make that issue aware to the council uh, if there's any questions about that. Sure. Um, I am employed by Andrews Davis, a law firm in Oklahoma City. I've been with them for seven years. I do only Native American law and litigation. Another, another member of our 25-member firm is currently serving as the Attorney General for the United Couture Band. His name is Ken Belmard. So our firm does work in that capacity. Um, to my knowledge, we are not entered in any uh, litigation, as in I believe another law firm handles that, but we do work for them as well. I didn't Let me interrupt you sure. just a second. Ken, the audience here... Can you hear okay? Okay, thank Am you. Am I not speaking loudly enough? Th that's fine. Thank you. They said they can. They can hear you. Um, uh, I guess what I will do is tell you a little bit about the Seminole situation, how it began, um, my first-hand knowledge of, of how it has somewhat ended and where, the, where we can distinguish where we are. In 2000, the Seminole Nation um, embarked on reforming their constitution, and in particular they had an election wherein uh, the chief's race was disputed. And at that time, uh, election appeals were filed, and a myriad of conflicts arose out of that turmoil. At the same time, they attempted to amend their constitution, and in that amendment, uh, one of eight, they tried to remove from their 1969 constitution recognition of two freedmen bands. Um, the Seminole Nation, like the Cherokee and the other five civilized tribes, have a Treaty of 1866 with very similar language concerning the rights of freed slaves. And the Seminole um, had historically recognized two member, uh, two member bands of their 14 members to be freedmen bands. And those two members um, have two representatives each that sit at council. They have a 28-person council, and four of those members are freedmen. Um, I can tell you today that four freedmen sit on that council, and they voted last month. So that's fast forward. But how we got to that point, um, I must say, was highly litigated. The freedmen had sat on council historically, and um, when they were voted to be removed from council, uh, two things in particularity happened. One, the United States government, by way of a letter from um, then Secretary of the Assistant Secretary of the Interior, Neil McCaleb, sent a letter that said, you are no longer federally recognized for government-to-government -government relations. And I am quoting that. No longer federally recognized for government-to-government -government relations. Um, let me tell you that it's not a good place to be if you're an Indian tribe. Uh, at that point in history for the Seminole, again, their, their chief's race is still debated. They received this letter. And at that point in time, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs no longer recognized the actions of their council without the freedmen sitting and voting. So at some point, there were two councils. At some point, there, there was one council. But at no time were any resolutions uh, considered valid from, I believe it was December 21st of 2001, until the next, excuse me, September of 2001 until December of 2002. During that time, um, all of their federal funding and federal programs were either retroceded or reclaimed, their 638 money, and all of their contracts. Um, all of this is a matter of public record. They were attached as exhibits to a multitude of litigation matters. I'm not giving you client confidential information. Uh, just so you know that the, the federal government decided at that time to establish a caretaker government for the Seminole Nation. And in doing so, they chose one of the chiefs 
um, to be the, for lack of a better word, the superintendent of ATG funds, H tribal government funds, wherein independent contracts could have been made from ATG funds. That was in that that year where there was no other council meeting. Now, the council continued to meet, pass resolutions, and um, move forward, but again, they were not recognized. At the same time, the opposing chief set up different offices and different federal employment numbers and employed people, and there were two governments going on. At this exact moment in time, began the Friedman litigation, and that is what I'm calling it because um, there, I have no other name for it. Um, in the Seminole Nation, recognized in their constitution, they are, they are called Freedmen members. It's not meant in any way to be disrespectful. Um, they instituted some litigation in the Eastern District. And I believe that uh, the same attorneys representing uh, the Freedmen in the Cherokee cases are similar, and if not exactly the same. So, the the tribe was not functioning, and this litigation was going on, and um, federal dollars were not flowing, okay? And in February of 2003, the chief was finally recognized um, after the council was reconstituted, and I will I'll explain that. But I should tell you it was the other chief. So for a whole year, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had one chief, and um, come to find out, it, it, after the election was certified, it was the other. It's just another problem. But at that time, in December of 2002, they received a letter from uh, then Secretary, Assistant Secretary of the Interior, Kevin Gover, that says, you are now reconstituted. Uh, Seminole Nation General Counsel shall be recognized, and it listed an attachment to that letter listed who the band representatives would be seated at council. That entire year before, there had been administrative appeals of BIA action in one federal lawsuit wherein the Seminole Nation sued um, the United States government for this caretaker government, for the um, removal of ATG funds, 638 money, the whole, the whole package. When they were reconstituted at that time, they took action to um, certify their election and move on with their chief and move forward. Now, the litigation was still pending in the Eastern District concerning the freedmen. And not a whole lot had been done in that, that year because there was, there was not much action on behalf of the Seminole Nation. And I believe that is where the Bureau of Indian Affairs took a very active role in um, representing what I believe they, they thought was their role on behalf of the nation and what we ultimately ended up with um, in, in settlement talks that I can personally tell you the Seminole Nation at no time authorized settlement negotiations on any of their Freedmen litigation. Um, we were hired in 2003 when the new chief came in. I've survived two um, chief's elections, two different administrations, neither administration at any time passed any resolution or executive order in any regard to negotiate settlement in those litigations. Um, it had been represented to the federal district court that that was the case on behalf of the federal government. And I do not know if the federal government instituted um, settlement negotiations with anyone or not, but it was not on behalf of the Seminole. What happened subsequently in the Tenth Circuit was a motion to dismiss had been filed by the previous counsel for the Seminole Nation. And um, that had been pending for quite some time. In the interim, um, in that lawsuit, they had sued the United States government and the Seminole Nation. And it was becoming very evident that that wasn't going to work because we enjoyed sovereign immunity. So another case was filed in the D.C. Circuit Court um, and in the District of Columbia. So there were two cases pending in 2003. Within two months of that case being filed, the Tenth Circuit ruled that the Seminole Nation did enjoy sovereign immunity. It was immune from suit. It had not consented to the lawsuit and should be dismissed. Um, it also ruled that it was an indispensable party, that a global settlement could not be reached without participation of the Seminole Nation, and the court recognizing that the Seminole Nation would not participate would dismiss. So, um, unlike the current Cherokee matter, 
not in the Tenth Circuit. Um, unlike the current Cherokee matter, when we were in the, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, um, we tried to consolidate those two cases. We tried to make that, that same ruling apply in another circuit and eventually were dismissed out. Um, you, I believe, have uh, the different circumstance that you were not sued initially. You've joined, you've joined the litigation, and uh, that is highly distinguishable from where we were. So I would at this time tell you that uh, the Seminole Nation was under sanction from the Bureau of Indian Affairs until 2005 on their federal funding for having two governments, um, for indirect costs having to be returned, for um, a myriad of contractual issues <coughs> that all stem from that letter of September 29, 2001 that said you are not recognized for government to government relations. I don't recommend that. <laughs> it's not good. Um, but I can tell you that um, gaming continued, um, which was a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, if you're not recognized, well, maybe your gaming commission isn't recognized. Well, who's regulating you? Well, there are a lot of people who, who had a lot of questions about went on, what went on at the Seminole Nation during that period of time. They received a federal closure order. Um, in fact, they received two. Um, during the time that they were not recognized. Uh, the Seminole chose to ignore that and litigate it and did end up in a public settlement um, December of 2005 wherein they were, had been closed for nine months and had an $11.27 million fine. So uh, we are here today to say that the Seminole Nation has uh, subsequently had an election that was not contested. Uh, both Freedmen bands sit at council today. They do vote in our um, council meetings. There are two divergences um, amongst the Freedmen and the Seminole Nation. Some uh, have claimed that they are uh, of mixed descendants and have a claim that they should have a CDIB card, and some believe that they are actually Freedmen and who have not intermarried, who should be recognized separately. Um, Regardless, both of those two bands still sit on council, and um, there have been attempts by the current council to discuss alternatives to that, and they have not happened. Um, there has been strict guidance from the Bureau of Indian Affairs as to the course of action should they take that again. Um, another distinguishing fact that I must tell you is that the secretarial election that was conducted for the amendment of the, of the Seminole Nation Constitution, the original election. Um, the petition for that secretarial election was never submitted. In the turmoil between the two chiefs, it was never submitted. So at no time had that election ever been certified for the constitutional amendments. The Bureau of Indian Affairs would never have recognized it without that petition. So had that part been litigated, it would still have been uh, thrown out would be what I could say. I would be happy to entertain your questions. I know that was a, a lot of information. Um, I hope it was helpful. I, again, have no intent to sway you one way or the other about your litigation. Um, I'm a member of this tribe. I want to see the very pos best possible outcome for this tribe. Um, how long was the funding cut? How long I, I, did it take you to get it back? Or some of it back? I know that it's not they're all. Still, they are still making attempts to um, recontract for services and funds that they have lost today. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Certain things required clean audits for so many years that that time has not passed. Um, they have been out of sanctions since July of 2005. So I can say from December 21st of 2001 until July of 2005, they had financial difficulties in making OTFM uh, drawdowns, um, applying for federal aid, receiving federal aid grants, in particular ATG monies. So did offices close and people go home? Yes, ma'am. And it took you approximately three to five years? Uh, what? What? number of years would you say that you started recuperating the federal monies and the, and the, the employees to come back to work? The, um, when I say people went home, it wasn't, 
like I said, there was also this chief selection issue that y you don't have at all. <laughs> Two governments kept going. One eventually was, was re-recognized, and one of them was receiving ATG money from the BIA. But that money was still there in a limited form. So I can't say that it stopped altogether. But I can say that... Um, it decreased considerably, though, didn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Council have questions? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. But what I just heard was the funding was frozen because of the turmoil among elected officials in different administrations, but not because of the freedom issue. There were two issues going on at the same time from the same election. The chief's race was contested. It's the same election from July of 2000. And the constitutional amendments were on that ballot as a secretarial election. One was the tribal election, one was the secretarial election. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, that was a July election. It was September when they received the letter that said no more because they, uh, the freedmen were not allowed to vote at council. And I must stress that they have two seats on council. They have historic, excuse me, two bands on council. They had historically two bands on council, um, and they were excluding them from those meetings. So that's at the time when the government, excuse me, the federal government said no longer recognized, when they were excluding them from voting on council. just happened to be that all of this menagerie was going on at the same time. Chuck? Then did the federal government or the BIA, <coughs> both the same, did they take any stance on the by blood requirements? Did the court speak to that issue? No. Um, in particular, the Seminole Nation Constitution um, has exceptions for freedmen membership into the tribe, and their membership code as is, is analogous to the language in the Constitution that the blood quantum requirements for membership in the Seminole tribe are accepted uh, for freedmen. Then, what about the Treaty of 1866? How did the federal government deal with that? They did not have to address it. Um, what may be different from the Cherokee versus the Seminole cases is we were dismissed. We never argued the merits of the case, um, wherein the, the legal argument as whether this should, should be this way or it should be that way. What was argued is the sovereign immunity issue, the indispensable party issue, and whether a settlement could be reached. Um, one of the things that was sought in the settlement that the Seminole Nation did not participate in is, is uh, they had received a $58 million judgment fund like, like many tribes had received um, many years ago. And those monies were sought, in particular, um, the, the federal government is the trustee of those funds. The tribe was not functioning, but those funds were never touched. To your knowledge, are any of the same judges involved in this? No. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bill John? Hey. And so the Seminoles paid $11 million in fines and lost millions of dollars in funding, correct? They are still paying the $11.27 million out in a uh, pre-opening agreement settlement that's available publicly on the Internet. Um, Were they out any attorney fees? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. They, um, I can speak to, um, we were hired in 2003. I can say this started in 2000. Um, there were approximately count five law firms that I know of up until we were hired that I, I couldn't speak to the amount of money was oh, spent. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> doubtful, doubtful. Um, I do know that when, when we applied for the Seminole Nation AG position, part of our agreement with them, and this again is on a public record, is that we did a whole lot of pro bono work for them up front because they weren't functioning and we knew that if they didn't get to a place where they could function then they couldn't pay us. Um, so initially, you know, we were paid and we were not paid. But they spent a lot of money and they will continue to pay back um, the 11.27 million unless they reach other agreements. But I can also say that they've also tried to negotiate down the repayment of uh, the disputed indirect costs, but they don't go away. That's substantial. Yes. Chuck. 
if the Seminole Nation was not part of the settlement uh, discussions, who, who were the parties to that? I knew I would get this question. <laughs> um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Justice. In particular, uh, um, some of the same attorneys that I know that the Cherokee Nation will be dealing with. Thank you. Uh, there's guardian ward relationship. They uh, they believe that as a trustee and for your benefit that they they serve in that capacity as well over your federal funding. So with your health care facilities. Uh, the Seminole Nation at present have a dialysis center and they um, share services with the Chickasaw Nation at Carl Albert Hospital. Um, they didn't receive any IHS funds during that time. That's what I thought. They have a, and they now have a private contract for their dialysis center uh, that stemmed from that time. So in essence, the Seminole Nation is still trying to recoup the federal money that they initially had in the form of grants and IHS, possibly housing. You're still trying to recoup and re get those reinstated for the lack of a better word. Um, I would say they're on the road to recovery. Um, they have, I'm certain it's not 100%, but they have a substantial, if not all, of the major funding contracts back. Um, you know, there's things out there that you wouldn't think of your law enforcement uh, certifications and contracts. Um, the li Seminole live horsemen are no longer recognized. Um, and so they lost I'm, I'm assuming the Seminoles had state compacts, maybe, did they? Tobacco, uh, tobacco motor fuels, and eventually and a gaming. What happened with that? Those continued. Those continued. Mm -hmm. And the gaming, you said, uh, was to be discontinued, but they operated the game in any way, and then out of that came the repercussion of the fines. Yes, and, it, and I should be qualifying that statement. It, the gaming being fined $11.27 million just didn't have to do with the tribe being closed. But as a symptom of the tribe being closed, lack of regulation led to... Um, an eleven point two seven million dollar fine. Okay. And the question of your sovereignty uh, was that also in litigation? Um, I don't know how you mean. Uh, being a sovereign nation, was there litigation? Uh, did you have to uh, respond to any entity that it was trying to take your sovereignty away, or saying you weren't a sovereign nation? Well, initially. They filed administrative appeals on all the federal action concerning not being recognized and exhausted their administrative remedies and then went to the Eastern District Court to, um, for lack of a better word, regain that federal recognition that they had lost. That's what I was and at the same time in the Tenth Circuit, they were addressing the Freedman issue wherein they upheld that this was a sovereign entity that they were an indispensable party and that matter would be dismissed or the Seminole Nation would be dismissed. Uh, this what? Thank you. On the Constitution, what are the fundamental differences between the Constitutions in reference to citizenship? Okay, the Seminole Nation Constitution, much like many of the constitutions from that era in the 60s, is the uh, it's the American Legion Constitution. That was the draft the Bureau of Indian Affairs was using at the time. And um, the, it does have a Bill of Rights, and it does give limited rights to, um, to freedmen. It, in particular, in the Constitution from 1969, recognizes and names out the Dozer Barkas and Caesar Brunner bands, which are the freedmen bands. And um, the Cherokee Nation Constitution is unlike that. <coughs> David. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, did the Seminoles have any treaties that, that the government went back on to, in order to just close them down and close their programs down? <coughs> the, the Treaty of 1866, which the five civilized tribes have a very similar if not analogous treaty, um, that was the treaty that was in litigation in the Tenth Circuit. But that was not used to retrocede or recapture funds. They had done that administratively under 
the 638 regulations and laws that allow them, if they think that your government is in peril and that you cannot manage your money, they can come in and, and seize those dollars. They, had, they were separate. Thank you. Uh, just excuse me a second. Todd? Yes, I'd like to make a comment before I have a, uh, another engagement to attend a son's basketball game that I coach, and I'm going to be late. But uh, I wanted to uh, uh, make the comment that uh, you know uh, there are there are similarities, similarities, and there are differences in this situation, and I think that you know that they're very important on both sides. But uh, one biggest, well, one of the biggest differences was that at the Seminole Nation's time, there was a Tremendous uh, disunity in the election process between, you know, basically two competing chiefs, two competing councils, correct? And and, and that is something that I think that, that, that this council and this administration needs to be cognizant of is that, you know, this is a very extremely important situation and that um, all parties need to uh, look towards the Cherokee Nation's best interest. And um, I'm Glad that I uh, was able to invite you, and it is an honor to have Ms. McBee here. Uh, I know Ms. Hammonds has some additional comments, but I will not be able to uh, remain. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate. Thank you. Um, I think that we all know, and, and this has made it um, perhaps brought, brought home to some of us how... Um, how bad this can get. Um, um, however, we are not the Seminole, and there are major differences. I want to point out a couple of them that are public record. There are others that I will talk to you about privately, but we are in the middle of litigation, and the press is here, and it would be very ill-advised for us to discuss complete strategy in the national and state media, and I won't do that. But let me tell you that some of the big differences between us and the Seminole. They are they're in a different place now than they were then. We are in a much more stable place than they were even then. They did not then and do not now have a tribal court system that would have allowed these the freedmen plaintiffs to have sought relief in the tribal courts. And of course you know that we do. Um, although the treaty language is similar, they do not have the statutory um, and case law precedent that we, that we have with our language. Also, one big difference, one very practical difference is that the Freedmen plaintiffs in the Seminole case were not allowed to vote on that constitutional amendment. Um, I think that I will stop with those, those major points, but... I think that uh, Ms. McBee's comments were something that we all needed to hear and I'm very proud of her as a fellow Cherokee and glad that she could be with us today. And if I can answer anything more, I'll be happy to do so. Council, I have any questions of Mrs. Hammonds? I do have Ms. McBee. Okay. Uh, Ms. McBee, we have some more questions, please. Oh. Okay. After reading this letter from the Department of the Interior, as a Cherokee citizen to your council, what would your recommendation be? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, first of all, I'll tell you, I, I would be remiss and tell you that um, my legal opinion is that my private opinion and my legal opinion are often divorced from each other, and I'm not going to tell you how I voted in the last election. I hope you don't ask me. Um, but I, I must say that this letter in particular um, doesn't say a whole lot to me. It tells me that the Bureau of Indian Affairs is uh, taking things under advisement. Um, I don't view this letter threatening one way or, or the other. I think it, it could have said more. It could have said less. I think it's I think it's more benign than overt. Okay. Does that help? No. I mean, the letters that, that the Seminole Nation received were very clear. They were warned beforehand. Um, they had meetings with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. If you don't start including them in council meetings, this is what is going to happen. Um, and then they started receiving the letters that said, 
loss of recognition, and then they received the letter that said you are not recognized. So the, it didn't happen like a light switch. So you think this might be just like the first letter? I, I think this letter is um, a very Bureau of Indian Affairs letter. <laughs> <laughs> It, it tells me very little. And as to that, if I can add, um, as to number three, we've not approved the recent referendum. Um, I, I don't know what Mr. Cosby sent, uh, but it was my understanding um, from talking to him that he was going to send on behalf of the Election Commission a letter similar to what he sent to me, and that was just informative. Um, there's nothing in our law that requires uh, bureau approval of, of uh, the referendum vote, and I, I would be surprised if he had asked for it. So we've not approved it. Well, fine, no one asked you. Would be my initial response. Okay. Melanie, you have a comment? You, yes, I, ha I have a request. Um, since we're on this uh, agenda item and it's ENF committee, um, uh, felt it was appropriate to bring to you a request for an additional appropriation um, and that would be to defend this matter, the election, this case um, and when we passed the budget at the beginning of the fiscal year obviously we didn't think we would be joined as a party to this suit and we have now been joined as a party. Our sovereign immunity is waived and those are pretty serious matters and we need to uh, make sure the nation is defended properly and so um, I'm requesting an additional five hundred and twenty thousand dollars for this fiscal year to defend the nation in this matter so that's my request Madam Chair thank you for this ENF meeting today or next month I think it's imperative we we don't know uh, when these matters are going to come forward, we expected um, court action before now, as a matter of fact, either in our court or the federal case uh, following the election. That hasn't happened, and it somewhat surprised me that it hasn't happened, uh, but could happen any day now that the letters for, from registration have gone out to the affected citizens. I move that we amend the agenda to consider the additional appropriation of 520000 Second. Second. Bill John. When did you know that you were going to need some of that? Well, I think we could have had anticipated it when we were joined. Um, when, certainly when our election was attempted to be intervened into, that's another another indication. I think we get indications all along about how long this will go, how much money it will take, um, uh, how long a, an issue it will be, and I think we just heard today that it may be quite a long issue. Um, and we know that we haven't asked for this money at the beginning of the year, and, um, and that's why I'm bringing it to you now so that we can consider it. We have a motion to amend the agenda, and we have a second, and we have a call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign? Aye. Aye. Want to do a roll call? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Motion carries. Madam Chair, uh -huh. I'd like to move to approve the additional funds requested. So I call the motion. Yes. I'd like to offer an amendment <clears throat> that prior to the dollars being released that we have an itemized report of all attorneys and firms and itemized amounts spent on the premium issue since 2003 under a separate cut. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Discussion? Madam Chair? Yes. I want to ask that we have a special meeting on uh, 
to discuss the landfill, and that's going to be April 16th at 1.30, and I'm going to ask that we table this until that time to give us time to research and, and visit with the chief and visit with uh, our council attorney, and uh, and it will still have time to get to, to full council if we do that. So I move to table this until the, the meeting that I'm going to ask for. I have a motion to table. Do I have a second? second if it's at two. Well, it anyway. Okay. Okay. We can do that. But before, uh, do we need that money before then? Because we're still talking about after council. And they can't get it until after council anyway. Okay, because you're saying you, if you go forward, you put it on the agenda. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take the school council on okay. the next day or that day. On the 16th. Uh, yes, Bill. Madam Chair, uh, I just want to make clear, this is to defend our property <coughs> and the money that we're asking for to defend the freedmen, right? And this right. is the other that we lost. We had, we had a motion, we got a point of order, had a motion to table it. It's in the discussion. Uh, <coughs> you, we have a second. Um, you should don't take the second. second. I'm sorry. Yes. To the uh, four, 16 at two. Mm -hmm. and all those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Right, sure. 16. Yes. For that same meeting, I would like to be able to discuss the uh, uh, the landfill and have Doug Lane and the owners or producers of the landfill and Cali here at that time at the two o'clock meeting. I agree. Okay. Well, motion second. All right. Have a motion have a second. Uh, David. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, all opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yes. Melody, I'd like to, the same motion I offered earlier, I would appreciate if we could have that information that I asked for prior to this meeting on April 16th so we can kind of get handled on that. Okay. Okay. Oh, I need to make a motion to that effect, or can you get that to me? Yeah, on, on the can land as long as I have sufficient time to do it, and I think I do. On the litigation and the landfill, litigation bodies, whatever, and the landfill information, right? What, what landfill information do we need? Isn't that what you asked? I, I asked that Doug Bain, Kelly, and... Oh, well, I certainly will invite yeah. all those parties. Yes. yes, be here that, so we can get a, a full and good understanding. Yeah. Um, Jack, I think right. you and then Don. I'm chair. That's the day that we have the resources meeting at Delonica starting at 11 and then the lunch and afterwards. Right. So, so will we have time to yeah. get back here by 2? Uh, by 1.30, but yeah. we'll make it to you. Jack, the ball. The uh, meeting, I thought everybody had not got the notice by now, but that meeting we had scheduled at Delonica, we came to the regular meeting in May because the group from Bull Paula couldn't be here. They had other activities going on, and uh, uh, I thought we'd have been notified about that. No, no. Okay. So the 416 yeah, dates okay, 14. and the time's okay. Yeah, the regular, regular time in May. Okay. Whatever that is. Four o'clock. So yeah. we're, we're, we're okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, regular meeting is 4 o'clock. So instead of it being 11 o'clock in the morning, it's going to be 4 o'clock like usual. So this will be at 2. Um, does the council have any other questions of these folks or Mrs. McVeigh? Does the council have any other questions of Mrs. McVeigh? I have. Go ahead. Comment. I do appreciate you coming and yes. and being candid with us, even though you didn't get paid. And then I'd like to, I'd like to make one comment. Does the audience have a question to Mrs. McBee? Who's your daddy? Okay. Who's your dad? I claim it. <laughs> I, I must also thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I do also need to extend. Chief Haney's best wishes to this council. He is, um, it was at his discretion that he allowed me to come today to speak to you honestly about some of these issues. And, and we appreciate that so much. Don and David. Yeah, you might be related to the Garvin family. I believe your mother is my grandmother's Aunt Elsie. <laughs> I was going to call you cuz until you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I 
Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. All right, moving right along, we have uh, item number five, a resolution donating the mobile unit. Yes. Madam Chairman. Yes. Uh, this mobile unit has been several discussed here several times. We were going to donate it to a group that wanted it. Nobody wanted it. We gave them permission to trade it in on a van. <coughs> they could buy the van cheaper without trading it in. So that didn't seem like a good deal. And uh, emergency management of Cherokee County has asked for that van. They've got a grant to uh, fix it up and use it as a uh, emergency command center. They already have a contract with us that if we have an emergency in any of the 14 counties that they'll come. So I move that we donate the van to emergency management of Cherokee County. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Morning. Can I second Phyllis? Oh, thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving along to Treasurer's Report, Cherokee Connect. Um, I'm going to the table since the Treasurer's not here. Okay. Will you just speak to it again? Madam Chair, I was just going to note that there have not been any more recent updates since the last full council meeting where the treasurer did give a report on connects. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> uh, we have a motion to table. We'll have a second discussion. Uh, discussion would be, uh, would, uh, could we table it till that? Table, no discussion. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's motion to table, no discussion. Stand to be corrected. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Now we move. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'd like to amend the agenda to ask that report be made on the April 16th meeting at uh, 2 o'clock, and I put that in the form of a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Have a motion, have a second. Discus oh. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same <coughs> sign. Motion carries. Report for the treasurer. On the 16th. Okay, GPR equipment. Madam Chair, it's visiting out of the uh, uh, language committee, and they're needing to uh, 22,000 to actually buy some equipment to uh, to to do the grave uh, location and, and such. And uh, what is that? Uh, anyway, they're, they're asking to spend $22,000 or what $22,000 to, uh, to buy a machine. Okay. And I uh, put that on the Okay. Have a motion, have a second, have any discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving along to the Boys and Girls Club. Who's presenting that? Right. Bill John. Uh, Madam Chair, this came through committee and they're asking for $65,000 for their summer pride. Uh, they represent 1,700 students, and I move for its approval. Second. Have a motion, have a second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion here. Long. Uh -huh. Housing Accessibility Program. Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, it's reported to us in committee that the housing accessibility is down to almost nothing. It's uh, $2,700. This is the program that builds ramps and widens doors for our elders, and I'm, uh, I'd put a motion that we put two hundred fifty thousand dollars in that program. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Road and bridge project request. Uh, Doug. <coughs> Was that two hundred thousand? Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty thousand. Okay. They're in, uh, right in front of the mod package. <clears throat> this month's road and bridge programs are as follows for the motor fuel road projects. Um, Mr. Garvin is sponsoring $30,303 for the Crider Road Loop project as well as the Weber Falls South project in the same amount. 
um, that will deplete this year's funding for motor fuels. Mr. Hoskins sponsoring 10000 for the senior citizens parking. Mr. Thornton, 26780 for Cherokee Village, Sequoia County. Mr. Larry, 34341 for Oaks Fire Department Road, East Phase 2. Ms. Shop Pouch is contri also contributing $8,008 $8 for that same project. Motor Vehicle Road Projects has Smith Ferry Road, Mr. Garvin is sponsoring, $42,285. Novina Shop Pouch, $3,500 for the Stanwady Road, East Phase 2. Mr. Garvin is also sponsoring out of his vehicle tax, 42286 for the Coffee Road North. Ms. O'Leary is sponsoring Oaks Fire Department Road East Phase 2, an amount of $75,205. Ms. Shop Pouch is also contributing to that project, $6,071. There are two, there's one project that is, um, was not on the original uh, packet that came to you that Mr. Lynn in the Roads Department and uh, asked that uh, Mr. Crittenden and Mr. Martin's project for the Salem Road in the amount of $48,392 each <coughs> would be amended to this list. There are two projects for special bridge and access funding, $18,803 from Mr. Garvin for the Reed Road uh, low water replacement. And Mr. Thornton, $3,791 for the Cherokee Village, Sequoia County access. And they all fall within. There's detailed reports um, that are in your packet that will identify that Mr. Garvin's motor fuels, Ms. O'Leary's motor fuels, Ms. Shophouse's motor fuels are all fully expended in motor vehicle, Mr. Garvin is fully expending his Miss O'Leary and Miss Shop House with these projects. And that completes the road report. Uh, Chair. And Chair, and I assume that we'll vote on these uh, as a package, but I need to point out that the $10,000 that I've requested for the senior citizen parking, it is an after-the-fact funding. It was not intentional. Um, the uh, city uh, street uh, commissioner came to me with this request, and I explained to him that the ordinary course of action is that we help counties, and so I requested from Todd Hembry an opinion whether this could be used on uh, city property. And uh, during this time, uh, the city uh, commissioner, and he understands that what he did was incorrect, but he went ahead with the project. It was far more than $10,000. Our portion was going to be $10,000. But I don't feel it's fair to come to you and, and ask you for $10,000 unless you know the situation that took place. The money will go uh, for the parking lot of the senior citizens exactly like, I, like it was intended to. However, if you went there today, there's already asphalt. So uh -huh. you know, with that being said, if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. To top, but Todd did, did give me the opinion that it's perfectly fine and to go ahead and do those, uh, and spend that amount with the city. So with that being said, that's my 10,000 portion of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jackie Bell. That was your explain the ADR County Project to begin with and how we pay for money. Um, well, I don't have the detail to the project itself, but um, I don't see Michael Lynn here. Um, but he brought over the project and expressed the need for the, uh, it's a substantial size project, right. and that you were uh, splitting your funding between the three uh, county commissioners, yeah. and uh, this project would consume one of those county commissioners' <laughs> allocations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Is that it? I have a motion for approval. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay. Mod 6? Yes. Uh, with the body's permission, uh, I can go ahead and include the, uh, the previous individual appropriations to this mod package that, that you just addressed with the GPR equipment, housing accessibility, boys and girls club, and add those to this package. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, relatively short mod package. 
uh, has a general fund, has, does have a couple of discretionary uh, budgets in it, but uh, before we get into that, there's DHHS General has two carryover adjustments and a new NARCH grant right. for 224000 Department of Education has a NAVTIP grant award of 274000 for a total of 497000 of grant awards this, year, this month. The Mod 6 has 17 budgets in it. It's increasing $1.8 million. Community Recreational Center is being requested of discretionary funds for $422,000 uh, for a community rec center at Marcoma property. There was no other documentation or capital budget justification provided, so I, I wasn't able to uh, assess any more information about this budget. The next item was a first response training program. That's the second year of a two-year request of 139000 of discretionary funds uh, for capital equipment only. And again, I, I, we don't have any other documentation. The cultural renewals requesting $93,000 uh, 93, of, of discretionary funds. Um, and I put a note in here, this program has incurred over 10000 dollars of expenditures and encumbrances in this year without any budget authority. So I think we need to, um, I just wanted to point that out that we need to be a little uh, more careful in our um, uh, financial system um, of ensuring that our budget edits are intact and working and where accounting units cannot be incurring expenses without legal spending authority. The Nahasda Fund is increasing $1.2 million. Um, there's a uh, closeout of the 2003 Indian Housing Plan, $56 to close that out. Uh, and there's 13 budget items related to the 2005 Indian Housing Plan to expend the remaining um, $1,192,000. And this is in um, agreement with the recently amended and approved 2005 Indian, Indian Housing Plan fund balance. And other than what I've already mentioned, I found no other technical issues with or problems with the mod. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Phyllis. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's what that Salem said again about number three and how do we, I know that's not your responsibility, but I think that somebody needs to speak to how we're going to remedy of that situation, somebody can spend money without authority mm -hmm. to do that. I thought that was taken care of with the new lawsuit system. That we have spent lots of money for. At the beginning of a year, um, any budgets, although they may be recurring in nature, if they're not addressed in the Comprehensive Budget Act or the very first mod at, at a minimum, those accounting units should be deactivated with the budget edit controls that Lawson avails. Now, Lawson doesn't, we don't take it to its extreme where. Um, we impose budget edit controls on every single account. We usually do it on major uh, control accounts that will <coughs> indicate activity at that level. Payroll uh, is a good example of a control account that budget edits might work on. Indirect cost is another one. Uh, I'm not, I can't speak to this specifically because um, I just don't have that, that information for you. But uh, it's, it's relatively uh, minuscule in amount, but maybe something like this can, can uh, yield a, a tweaking of an internal policy that could keep something very larger than this like this from happening. Melanie, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I would. I think Doug's accurately uh, presented. We don't do budget edits on everything because we wouldn't want to kick out someone's payroll. Um, but we do do budget edits on the other line items that if, if it's outside the budget that that expense can't go through. So what may have happened is that we've got some miscoding of some staff costs or something like that that's hit a, hit an improper account. So in those cases, it may not always catch uh, something that's been improperly. I think Bill John has a question. Yes, and I would echo while you're up. Uh, can you give us uh, more detail on the Marcoma revival or? I can. Uh, that was a proposal primarily worked on by Health, but also uh, with Pods Group to uh, do something initially with the gym because that's the facility that is uh, probably in the best state of repair or require the least amount of money uh, because the other properties have some face paint and some other issues uh, to get up and running. And what the money is to do is to provide a staffer full time 
so that that facility can be open to the public and also uh, provide some money for equipment so that there's exercise equipment in there to be used. So the initial stage is to do a recreational facility that's open to not just employees but the public. But our kids can still use it to practice basketball and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and what's happened is they were using the facility there for a while and had a volunteer opening it up, and that's just not worked out. We need a staffer to keep it open. And this budget has seven full-time positions in it. One other thing on that uh, spending on county units without without budgets, um, maybe we could look at Lawson and see about implementing a policy that would deactivate any accounting unit without a legal budget. That way, um, at least we'll have kickouts that tell us if someone's trying to charge their time through an inactive or you know, unfunded activity. I think that's a good idea. Um, I think what's prohibited us from doing it is because it also prevents us from running reports and doing some other stuff. So I don't know if that's still the case or if Lawson can work through that. But I think so. Madam Chair, uh, I'm interrupting what we're on right now, but it's after 5 o'clock. Could we go ahead as a group and dismiss the staff that were here for reports so that they can go home with their families? Good idea. If that's okay with the staff, do I hear any objection from the staff? <laughs> Okay, submit written reports, please, staff. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your suggestion. Okay, now we're here. I move for approval of the budget. I move for approval. Second, and now are you going to roll these other things into that? Yes. Yes, sir. I have to get that. I apologize. Okay. Yes, sir. And I have the. Uh, GPR 22,000, 65,000 boys and girls, and 250. How much boys and girls? 65,000 yes. and 250,000 for the accessibility, housing accessibility subsidy. Right. We have a motion. We have a, a second. All those in favor? Uh, All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, was there? That's it, isn't it? That's it. Okay. Uh, we want to make an announcement for our next, our next meeting is April the 27th at 3 for e and f And, and uh, the special meeting is for April the 16th at 2 o'clock on the landfill and the uh, attorney seats, right? Attorney litigation. Okay. Got a, a move for the job. So hang on. Just quickly, I just wanted to let you know that the audit is here, so if you want to grab your copy before you right. leave. Thank you. Oh, well, let's not return then. Let's go through it now. Do you want to go through it, Melanie, today? <laughs> sure, you want to stay. <laughs> uh, yes, sir.